What? Hey, welcome everybody to another Security Professionals Roundtable. My name is Chad Lingefeld from Lockdock Security here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we're excited to be with you for another quality conversation, uh, hopefully to help move your businesses forward. I uh, appreciate HL Flake helping to promote and sponsor this today, and we're excited to kind of have a conversation around the topic of training um, and how you can utilize training to uh, you know, improve your skill set and to grow your business. And so I want to welcome in a couple of guests that we have today on the panel. Uh, we have Chad Tibbetts with us today. Chad, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. And uh, also Justin Smith from Frog's Lock. Uh, how are you doing, Justin? Frog safe and key. Frog safe and key. There we go. Good, good. How are you? <laughs> Appreciate you being here today. And uh, so the, co the topic of conversation today is going to be training and how you're utilizing different training opportunities. So we'll talk through some of that and then some of the kind of results of all of it and some ideas to maybe improve your training program as well. We'll share some of the uh, concepts and ideas that we're using here in our business. We were going to have our training director on with us today, but he is under the weather right now. So, uh, but we'll, we'll just kind of, uh, I, I guess, first do a, a little bit of introduction for those that don't know. Chad Tibbetts, go ahead and give us a little introduction, who you are, what you do on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. So again, I'm Chad Tibbetts. I'm with Asa Abloy Academy. So that is the training and development side of Asa Abloy DSS, so Door Security Solutions in the U.S. Uh, I'm a part of a team of five trainers that we travel nationally and up into Canada. And we train on everything from how to pin cylinders to installing hardware, how to order and price all of our components. But uh, so my background is in locksmithing. So this is kind of uh, my bread and butter. I'm the locksmith of the group. So I started in locksmithing. I did that for five or six years. And then I got specifically into safe and vault work before joining the Asaboli Academy team. And uh, training's always been near and dear to my heart because when you bring somebody new into the organization, um, what you're oftentimes looking for is an awesome attitude, right? Somebody who can pass the background check and an attitude, right? Um, that fits into your culture and then it's up to you to get them trained and up to speed. So i uh, glad to be here. Uh, obviously we're all locked down. The entire Academy train, uh, team is not traveling right now like we would normally do. So we've had to adapt and change. So I'm uh, interested in the conversation today. Very, thank you very much, Chad, for being here. Um, have, uh, have been a part of some of your training before. It's always very beneficial, very hands-on. Um, and it and it kind of shows the passion that you have for training our industry and helping us uh, to kind of move forward. So, uh, Justin, give us a little introduction to you yourself and your company, um, and where you're where you're based out of. Uh, Justin Smith, Frog Safe and Key, uh, based in Amarillo, Texas. I've been a locksmith for 12 years now. Uh, started definitely in the automotive side, but uh, really wanted to expand. There's so much for locksmithing. Uh, that I didn't want to be tied down to just the one deal. Uh, my my main concern was getting into high-end automotive, and once I succeeded most of that, I really went into the vault side. The residential commercial is a given for most people, but I really wanted to go to safe and vault, and now I run uh, uh, probably more than I can handle on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, well, that's that's pretty much just how we started up, and every time we get something that comes along and we get interested, and we we uh, we look into it more and more. So that's why I'm here. Very cool. Well, I I want to start with you, Justin, um, just from a question of as you're as you're growing a business, as you're hiring people, how how are you handling training? What are what have been some of the successes that you've had, or what have been some of the frustrations that you've had with trying to get a training program or getting folks trained in your organization? So the, the first thing we're going to do on any employee is we're going to let them ride with either me or, or my other lead tech. Uh, we just, and it's going to be a couple of weeks. It's not going to be like a couple of days. It's probably two, three, maybe in four weeks. And the main reason is to just to get to know them. Um, you're, what you're doing essentially is getting an extra set of hands. How useful those hands are at that time is, is unknown. It can vary from employee to employee. Some some people are scared to get involved, and some guys are hyped and they're ready to go. Um, so that that's our first step. Uh, 
the downside is finding those people who are really scared and timid and you just don't know if they're going to work out from the get go. Um, but when, whenever we get going further along, then we start giving them what we're seeing that they're actually getting hands on. They're retaining a little bit of information here, a little bit of information there. I like to call it the oil pan effect, the, the oil and a frying pan effect. You get a little bubble here, a little bubble there. And one side, it just kind of comes together. But, uh, that the biggest deal is just getting them hands on. Once we know that they're getting, they have some mechanical uh, skills and they're they're catching up a little bit, then we start offering them electronical or text style uh, forms of uh, education. Very cool. So, Chad, from your perspective, you're you're dealing with a lot of people in the industry, a lot of different companies. What are what? How are you seeing training programs kind of? come about what are the frustrations that people typically have when dealing with uh, a training program i think it comes down to time and expense right so you're hiring somebody more than likely with no experience oftentimes because we're in such a specialized industry if you hire somebody with experience Sometimes they're great. Oftentimes they come with a lot of their own bad habits that you then have to break potentially. And um, I'm not saying that about everyone that comes through that, that changes companies, but what I've seen in the past is sometimes uh, it, bad habits are hard to break. So, so time and then money, because you're paying these people, you have the expense of not only their salary or what they're paying per hour, but you also have everything else that comes with that as a business owner. So then the time side of it is it can take years <laughs> to get really proficient where you can take a lead tech and send them out on any call that, that you want to send them out on. And you know that you're not going to have uh, recalls. You're not going to have second trips out to the repair the same thing that end up costing you time and money uh, that damage potentially your reputation as, as a company. So you really have to be as a business owner all in. Right. You can't go into it just halfway. If you're going to train somebody, you have to train them. Mm. And um, so it's 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 expensive. It's very costly. But in the end, it's going to benefit your benefit your company uh, more than just saying, hey, you're now a locksmith. Here's a van. Here's a bag of tools. Now go out and make me some money. And what ends up happening is you damage your reputation as, as a company. They'll end up replacing a lock. Mm. Uh, potentially that doesn't need to be replaced and you know word gets around so protecting your brand is very important and i think that uh, the training of your employees is really key to that that's a very valid point a lot of times i know in in, in years past with our organization training was always something that we we felt like we valued but it was hard to actually put the time towards it, right? So right. it was something that we said that we valued, but in all actuality, we weren't putting the time and effort and energy towards it. And I think you bring a valid point that rep your, your reputation can be a lot more expensive than the time that it takes you to invest in uh, in the, the training programs themselves. So uh, very, very well said. So with that said, um, I know there are, a lot of training opportunities out now. There's online, there's, well, there used to be in person, but there's <laughs> online, there's virtual, there's a lot of different stuff. Uh, so I, I guess I'll, I'll start with, uh, we'll jump down to Justin and just ask, uh, how are you using, are you using online training? Um, how are you using it? Or are you doing it mostly kind of hands-on or on-the-job training? Uh, so most of our training uh, online personally is very difficult for myself. So I don't expect most of my guys to do it. Um, and the reason why is it seems like most of my employees are very hands-on like I am myself. So yeah, I could read something four or five times and still screw it up. But if I do it one time with my own hands, I'm probably going to nail it. Um, so whenever it comes to online material, we do typically steer away ourselves we do read a lot of material just to get a little bit of information because you never know where this one little piece of information will help you the most. Uh, but in the shop, we do a lot of hands-on. I've actually got I don't know, probably about 3000 square foot shop here that we, we throw anything you need or anything you're wanting to learn on that we're willing to show you. If we think you're at that level, we will help you at. 
uh, my favorite personal is actually going to classes, going to Flake, going to McDonald's Dash, going to stuff like that. I love, love, love going to classrooms. Uh, it is it is so much information, not just from a uh, a teaching aspect, because I've done some of the classes for for uh, for Flake. It's it's the knowledge that you're gonna get from just the person teaching it, but also from some of the guys that have all been doing it for 20, 30 years that all have. Or they're just taking a refresher course and they go, oh, man, we'll do it this way, too. So you can check this. So you're getting so much information. So it's always been my favorite is actually go to a classroom full of locksmiths, full of people from the industry and, and get all that knowledge just stuffed together in one room. Chad, how are how are you seeing that play out? Because I think that's very applicable. I, I don't think there's a lot of people that are going to disagree with what Justin just said. The hands on in-person training is by far the best. When that's not available, what are the other alternatives, and and how do you make those, uh, you know, available and engaging? I think that's definitely a challenge. But it's funny, I've been with a with us probably now for four and a half years training. But I feel like in a way I've kind of gone full circle back to the previous company because with my previous company I was a lead tech and then service manager and then area manager. But I tended to do a ton of training via phone right? Or virtual training. We were using Skype back then. Skype was kind of the only thing that would work for us. And it was kind of sketchy. It didn't work all the time. But I was on the phone constantly walking technicians through something that I knew they were competent enough to complete as long as they had some initial handholding. And handholding and not a bad, you know, it's not a bad thing. So I was on the phone a lot, almost like a tech support person. So uh, Asable Academy, we kind of switch. Uh, we're doing a, several different things. Primarily, we're doing 10 to 15 one hour sessions a week, virtual training where we have a live instructor teaching on a particular topic. But as a group, we're also calling into those uh, hospitals and those universities and our, and our locksmith partners out there and just being that person on the phone. It's nice sometimes just to bounce ideas off of and then. We have the benefit now of having smartphones. Uh, yeah. Just about everybody has smartphones unless they work in an ultra secure location where they're not allowed to have cameras. But for the most part, streaming video and saying, hey, I, I kind of understand what you're talking about, but hey, can you show me? And having that scheduled, let's say an end user or a locksmith is going out to install a bunch of electric latch retraction, sergeant exit devices, and they just need some help. So being available, Having that phone saying, hey, why don't you show me what you're looking at? Okay, yeah, it's that dip switch. You're, you're correct. And just like I said, helping out and being willing to help, not uh, treating the people that are asking the questions like they're dumb. Oh, you should know that. Just being really uh, humble and understanding. I think it's, it's tough to be patient sometimes, but you have to, especially when you're dealing with new people that are in the industry. They, you may have seen this for mm -hmm. 10 years, 15 years, but you have to realize that you were there you were them at, at some point, right? You, you, when you first got in, you rekeyed that quick set lock and it rolled off the counter and the pins and springs went everywhere, right? You most, were, you most were that person. Yeah. So I, I, I've got a question when it comes to a, essentially a training curriculum or a training program. And, and I, I kind of toss this to both of you. Um, and, and before we do that, Justin, I wanted to ask this question from your experience, time frame that it takes a new employee that you hire in to where they gain a level of independence when you can send them out. What does that time frame look like typically one for year. you? One, one year. One year. Okay. And and that was a very similar experience for me. I, I, I started in the industry back in 2004 and that was really kind of the, the pitch. And I've shared this story before. That was kind of the pitch for me was, uh, uh, yeah, you can come right along and learn and watch. And in about a year, year and a half, you might actually be worth something, you know? And it was like a bit defeating because it's like, well, wow, that's like an unknown time frame, And I don't really know what I'm actually shooting for. So I, I, I want to move into this kind of next conversation about what does a good training program look like? How do you set that up? Because I, I, I'll speak from experience experience on our end, you have Asa Abloy Academy, you have, you know, I, I was just listing out here other online opportunities. You've got a lot of stuff on YouTube. There's a lot of tutorials on YouTube um, that you can just kind of go on there and search and find certain things. 
how accurate are they? How you know how official are they? But there's there's their uh, information there. Obviously, Asa Abuli Academy. There's online pre-recorded type stuff. Then there's webinars, right? There's there's webinars that you go in and watch somebody do a PowerPoint presentation and go through that process. And then there's the virtual interactive, which is kind of what Chad was talking about, where you can really one on one go back and forth through a camera um, and be able to help people uh, people diagnose issues. But with all of those options out there, as, as, a, as a business leader, as a business owner, you're going, okay, that's great. Now I've got this new person that I've, I've hired, this, this, this person that's excited to join our industry, and I need to give them training. Where do they start? Like, what do, what do they start with? Do they start with how to cut a key? Do they start with how to pin a cylinder? Do, do we start them on master keying? Do we start them on interchangeable core? Like, how do we get them started through the process and then have a succinct curriculum that they would want to flow through to know what their progress is? I think that's an open question, honestly. Uh, I think you could really do that per employee. You're going to have people that... Uh, really catch on in one area versus the other so now if you have a shop that you are automotive only or your safes only or residential only you know where you're going down but if you are somebody and, and i'll tell you a lot of lock shops are becoming this way just like myself you are everything you you are are safe automotive residential commercial you know it, it just doesn't seem to end so it's hard to direct that. Now, what we like to do is we get, we've got five people here uh, and, and I've had a couple through the years I've managed another company. What you, what you have to really pay attention to is where are they catching on to so that you can kind of steer them down that path first to, to make them work keeping around, making your money that way they're paying for themselves and you go. And then as they're producing money, you kind of steer them into these other directions as well. Now, I, I, I can't speak for anybody who is very direct shop oriented, as like I said, a commercial residential only, you, you should have some sort of frame. But in my, in my, uh, in my experiences, it, it's, you kind of got to grab somebody see what they're catching on to, see what they like. Some people don't like certain fields or certain areas of the field. And yeah, that's part of the job. You're going to take the bads and the goods together, but you want them to be worth keeping, like I said. So if they're catching on to your automotive side, let them run that path a little bit more and then say, hey, you know, you're not doing much this week or you don't have much today or whatever. Um, go help out so-and-so. And, and let them get more experience on the residential commercial side and vice versa. Very cool. Chad, what are your thoughts on that? There's so many options out there. Where do you get started? How do you get, how do you get the, the process going? Yeah. So I think it definitely depends on your business model, your size of your business, right? Are you running um, five locksmiths or are you running 30 or 40? I think that uh, it really depends, but definitely I would start people online if you have people and say it's a Friday, you kind of finished your calls up, maybe they've got a couple hours left, rather than sweeping the shop, maybe you put them online and they get to work, uh, learn, you know, 30 minutes, an hour. I can, I can, I'm hands on as well, but I can pay attention to an online course for an hour or 45 minutes and give somebody some uh, more baseline information. I know that when I first uh, started in locksmithing, I didn't even know that there were grade one commercial hardware out there for a while because it was, hey, you're going to learn how to rekey basic residential grade two, grade three locks, and you're going to do that for a while. And then all of a sudden I got to work on a sergeant mortise lock and it was like, oh, wow, it's a whole different world out there. So being able to go online and learn that that world existed before maybe I was ready to do it hands on. Mm -hmm. Got it, could have got me thinking, could have said, oh, hey, I, I realized that there are a ton of different door closers out there already. There's a lot of different hardware options, a lot of different solutions. It's not just what I have in my van mm -hmm. as being what's perfect for that door for that day. So I, I think that the way that the online has evolved. So Asable Academy, for instance, we have over 50 online courses that are completely free for anybody registered for take. We don't sit there and... Uh, 
figure out who you are and then say, yes, you can join or you you don't. And additionally to that, Chad, I know you guys use our My Team functionality where you can actually put people underneath you and you can assign them courses. You can see when they've taken them, what their scores have been. And that's also a completely free service for anybody. Uh, you, can, you can do that and manage your own team. But I think that the, the virtual and the online, those are the initial, right? Those are the bite-sized training pieces. And then once you have that initial, then you've really got to, you've got to get hands on. There's is, like I said, there's no substitute for it. Do you have within, within the, the Academy uh, or is there a published list of kind of recommended basics? Like absolutely like the introduction, the locksmith one Oh one type type. Absolutely. So what we did a few years ago, about three years ago, we took all of our classes, our 50 online classes, and we broke those into buckets and we call them level one, level two, level three, level four, and you can take them in any order that you want. You don't have to take them in that particular order. But as a locksmith owner, it can be kind of a daunting task to say, hey, I've got this new person. Hey, I know they've got a couple hours today where we're not going to be running calls. Mm -hmm. You can even take these courses on your cell phone. You know, the screen is kind of small, but you can take them on your cell phone while you're in the van even. Plug in some headphones and take all the courses in level one. And it may be hey, how to hand a door. That's a pretty basic concept for somebody who understands hardware. But for a, for a new person, when you're talking about handing a door in a frame, let's say you're a locksmith that replaces doors and frames as well as works on the hardware. Well, are we talking about a reverse or a not a reverse, right? And are we talking about door closer? Because door closers are only a regular handed. They're not reverse bevel. So that type of thing, just being able to put somebody on a 30-minute online class yeah. that explains that. And then after they take the class, you as the owner or as the trainer can reinforce that and say, hey, you took that class. This is what we're actually talking about. So just just to kind of dial into what you were saying there, and I want to come down to Justin and to ask another question, a follow-up question on this, but through your my team function as an owner or a training director or whatever, you you have the ability to say, okay, here are all of my employees, all my team members. I can assign them different classes or courses to take and then now i can see if they've actually done it if they've completed it and then what the scores were and so that gives you some of that justin what have been what have some of the um maybe the way that you do it now how do you how do you manage a training program or manage the training for a new team member so you know john comes on board and we want to we we figure out what he likes we figure out what kind of he's catching on and which direction he's going to go how do i keep up with or how do you keep up with the things that they are learning and how to apply them. Um, I, w I don't feel in, in, in my level or in most people in my level are going to be able to keep up. Sorry, my chair is being stupid. Uh, are going to be able to keep up with what I'm saying is people in my shop of my level where there's five, six people here, multiple vans, you're not going to be able to keep up specifically on say a level uh, like Chad Tibbetts said, they have 50 people in it. They have 30 vans. They have had a lot more experience and a lot more, um, a, a lot more directive towards making sure they have this going uh, for the levels to keep up with it. So that's where you have to find a different is large versus small. Now in my area, I'm pretty large. I go to Dallas, I'm small. So here I'm large, but when we have our employees, we do pay close attention. Uh, I'm lucky that my wife is my business, business manager. So I have somebody that backs me wholeheartedly and we can say, Hey, you know, so-and-so you're not, you're not catching on to this. What's going on? What, what are you having problems with? So we take a more one-on-one -on -one directive with our employees. You know, I know you've done this job five different times or this same type of system five times. You're just not getting it right. Where are you having problems at? So we have more of a relationship with our guys so we can watch it more closely. We're not on a large scale. So for a larger scale, I can't answer that question because I've never been there one day, hopefully, but I'm just not to that point. But from our scale and most people that are at my scale, they are going to have that same relationship with all their employees. And they're going to say, Hey, we know you should be able to do this. What's happening. 
What aren't you understanding? And then we'll go from there and we'll help them out and maybe give them a different perspective. That's one of my biggest things is perspective. One person may understand it one way, another person understands it a different way, but they're the same thing. So, so you, you kind of handle it on an individual basis and just kind of yes. understanding where they are and what they're doing. Chad, from your perspective of all the companies that you, that you work with, have you seen some, some applications, some good best practices in place that you would say, Hey, these people have figured out something that kind of clicks and works, and this is a good model to follow. Absolutely. And also diving into some of my previous experience in training as a locksmith and as a safe and vault uh, technician working with a big company, I think team meetings were definitely really, really important. Having a, a powwow where you can get, even if you've got five people that are there locally, getting them all in a room and say, hey, I know you guys ran a ton of calls last week. Did you run into something that you'd never seen before? And how did you fix it? Did it work? It didn't work. Well, great. Even if something, even if you broke it, you still learned something, right? You say, well, we're not going to do that again. So everybody, this is the situation. This is what happened. This is what John, let's just say, use John's name. You know, this is what he did. It failed. We had a recall, but then this is how we came and fixed it. So I think having those open lines of communication and then also getting uh, that team environment going. So we had a, this was years ago, but we were using a, a chat app where all of our techs could communicate during the day. And if they ran into something odd they'd never seen before, even in a smaller company, we could send a picture and say, hey, has anybody seen this before? I have no idea how to get the lever off, or I don't know how to take apart this integrated uh, assembly, this exit device out of this storefront door so that I can get the cylinder out. So having those open lines of communication that are running all day long, all of that's super, super important. And then we also, just a really low tech, way to manage our own training. We had just a simple Excel spreadsheet. We had everybody's name on it and a huge line of, hey, have they rekeyed a cylindrical lock, a mortise lock, a deadbolt? I mean, it's basic things, but you can go through there and check them off, highlight them green, hi highlight them red. If they get a recall on something, you can go back through and just note that, hey, they had a recall on opening this particular type of safe or doing whatever. And then if they have it again, like you said, you can go back and say, hey, you've been having some issues with this. What's going on? And as a, a personal example, I had a technician that was working for me down in the Houston area, and he was getting recalls on opening some really basic B-rate safes. And he knew how to do it. I knew he knew how to do it, but he was having some issues. We were getting complaints from customers that he was taking too long. And I found out that it was because all his tools were broken. Hmm. And we had a budget. He could go buy new drill bits. He could go buy screwdrivers. He could do that if he needed them. And he was still using broken tools. So it was a mindset thing. He, he said, hey, well, I'm trying to save the company money by not spending money on tools. And I said, well, you're costing me money because you're not buying tools. And so he knew how to do it, but then it was kind of a mindset thing. So I think those open lines of communication, checking in with your, making sure that you address those issues. And again, messing something up is a phenomenal way of improving, of getting better, of making sure that next time you're going to nail it. Most definitely. So I'll give you two uh, ideas or two tips that we have uh, applied in our business over the years to kind of help with managing some of that. So uh, we have a weekly team meeting, very much like what you were saying, Chad, we have a weekly team meeting. And we I instituted years ago, now we've moved away from this from the size of our organization at the current moment, but it was a tips and tricks. And so every week, uh, a technician would come up with a, a five to 10 minute tip or trick. This is something I ran across in the field this past week. Here's how I solved it, and they would demonstrate it. Here's a here's a, a tool that uh, that I'm using to do this, or here's you know whatever, and they would go through a process of essentially sharing things they've learned in the field, very bite sized type things. Um, it did two things for us. One, it showed us areas that we were strong in. And, and that we knew what was going on, and it showed us kind of discovering new possible ways to solve solve issues. Uh, and it also showed us the other team members that were had never dealt with that before. So somebody would come up with something that maybe all of us would think is a simple 
uh, you know, simple tip or a simple trick that we've been doing for years. And half the room would be like, oh, wow, I didn't know that was was the case. So it's like, okay, this this is an eye opening experience. But the other thing is it showed us uh, uh, shortfallings that we had throughout our 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 installation process or our service process, because maybe the tip or trick that they would bring in would be a long cut, not, not a not a shortcut or a, a better way to do it, but a longer way to do it. And so it would give us an opportunity to improve that. The second thing that we did uh, several years ago was we put together a survey. And actually, I've got it on the screen here. Um, if I don't know if he can if he can put it up there, but basically we put together a, a survey through Google Forms. It was a, a quick, easy thing. Um, that uh, that we put together, and it was basically asking questions. Hey, when it comes to pinning, do you uh, on conventional pinning, do you, where do you rate yourself? I need training, a level one, or I got this, a level five. Uh, you know, master keying systems, multi lock, medico, you know, pinning large format interchangeable core, keyway identification, and we just basically sent a survey and said, give us your understanding of I got this, or I want more help with it. And then that allowed us to kind of gather all of the results. And that was, I, I'm looking at it right now, we had 11 responses. So this was a few years ago. It gave us the ability to tailor our future training um, on what the actual needs of our team was at the current moment by going, okay, well, it looks like we have a lot of people struggling in the Medico area. So let's focus more on the Medico training. And it allowed us to tailor that. And it was a simple, easy, free thing to do, but it was just getting an understanding of where everybody was how they rated themselves from a confidence level. I think Justin had a very good point where you have those individual relationships and you have those conversations with people and you know what they're wor- what's winning and what's not. But oftentimes the the individual doesn't possess the confidence to actually execute it on their own. So understanding where they think they rate on it um, is also a very beneficial um, beneficial thing. The spreadsheet idea, I like that as well. Just kind of keeping track of like the different t- the different tasks, the different things that you do in your organization and how p- if people have been trained on it, if they've not been trained on it, if they need more training on it and just kind of keeping that organized. Um, another question, has things changed for you or have things changed for you in the current climate since COVID-19 hit, businesses changed, economies changed? Have you changed or had the opportunity to do more training? So I'll ask the question in two ways. One for Chad, uh, have have you seen an increase in training through Asa Abloy Academy or through requests for training? And then the question for Justin, have you had to change the way that you're training or have you been had the opportunity to increase your training opportunities since that happened? So with Asa Abloy Academy, virtual was always something that we wanted to do but it wasn't something that we had to do. If we had the ability to do hands-on training, obviously our customers would prefer that. We as instructors would prefer to be one-on-one, face-to-face with our customers than doing it via a webinar. But when, when the lockdown happened, our manager, our director, he pivoted really quick, and we had, we were early adapters of the Zoom platform, which is basically what we're using today. And then we went through our entire lineup of instructor-led training that we would normally do hands-on and said, hey, what can we do and kind of squeeze it down to 45 minutes to an hour to give people some bite-sized information? And to date, we've had I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people have tuned in for our virtual training. And then we also decided every single one of those sessions, we would make available for people to download the the recorded session available for free. And we've had, I don't know, 8,000 or 10,000 downloads. So it went from a, hey, this would be really nice to do to this is what we have to do. And we've enjoyed it. Uh, we, we really enjoyed getting out there and then we open it up to questions. We have some interaction. And if we have a smaller class, we have some classes that we limit to uh, eight to 12 people, then we just allow people to unmute themselves and ask questions. And that's sure. something, again, we're available to do for locksmiths and our end users and our distributors. If there's something specific, we can custom tailor a session, a two hour session, a one hour session, a full day session on a particular topic. So again, just being flexible and embracing that technology. 
Thank you, Chad. Justin, I saw you got a smile on your face when I asked the question. What is uh, what what has been has been your experience? So, we've done zero training during COVID <laughs> because I, I I I'm not lying to you by the least. We probably double doubled our intake of phone calls. Oh wow! We blew up when this thing took off. I mean, it was absolutely insane. For we we were hunkered down. We'd already had the team meeting. I was like, y'all are still going to get a paycheck if you got to sit at home. I will take care of you. I promise. And then it just, it, it, the top came off. So we haven't, we haven't slowed down. Uh, literally still to this day, we're, we're booking. I'm actually contemplating getting another service van and hiring a new employee. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's a great sign. That's, that is not the normal in the rest of the industry. I can tell you that. It's, it's kind of crazy actually. Well, well, very good. So I, I guess in that sense, it's the, the ones that have had an opportunity to slow down, I know for us, we had about a month and a half of, of significant slowdown from a service demand. Um, and, and that was kind of our whole thing is we just kind of shifted back into hardcore training. All right, let's let's do everything that we can to get prepped for what we think is coming down the line. So for us, we pivoted over to uh, a lot of door operator training so we could prepare for for that and have our team prepared for that. Um, and, and a lot of, uh, a lot of protected key system type training. But, um, with, with that said, I, I guess I'll move on to one of the last questions is how can you measure the effectiveness of your training? How can you know this worked versus this worked? Um, and, and how do you, how do you keep track of that? Or how do you, and maybe keep track of it's a bad question to ask, cause we already kind of tackled that, but just how do you understand and measure that when you go through training or when you're teaching somebody something that they actually are getting it. I'll let you take that one, Chad. <laughs> Thanks. I think that for me and my personal experience, it was twofold. One, it was keeping, again, a finger on the pulse with the employee. An employee can tell you with their eyes wide open that they got something. But then when you send them out on a call, it's always nice to uh, get a customer survey. Mm. And the customer survey doesn't have to be an email that you send them and says, hey, how do you rate our service from a, a zero stars to five stars? But randomly giving, and uh, randomly, I guess is not the right word, but giving those customers a phone call and saying, hey, I noticed that we, we had a technician out there who was doing some work for you. Uh, that install can be kind of technical. How did the technician do? And then also kind of checking in on that as well as what did they look like? Were they professional? How did they greet you? Because training is not just technical. You need the technical training, right? That's half of it. But you also need the personal skills. And I found that we had to do a lot of personal skills training with our people as well. When we're sending them into banks, we're sending them into mm -hmm. hospitals, we're sending them into surgical wings and places, things like that. So the personal skills are just as important as the technical aspect of things. So uh, you can ask an employee, I think, all the time, hey, how you doing? And Chad, you can probably attest to this. Most of the time, they're going to say, I'm good. And then they're going to they're going to walk. Right. They're going to continue doing what you're doing. That doesn't really tell you anything. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's anything wrong with having those uh, those uh, those touches with your customer and saying, hey, how is my tech doing? We really want to make sure that we train them properly and that we're serving you the best way. So voice of the customer, I think, is key. I, it's a very, very valid point, Chad. I think that, um, you know, thinking through that, all of us in the locksmith industry regardless of if we think we have it nailed or not, should have a level of customer service training. And, and I think you probably hit the nail on the head there, which a lot of us focus so much on the technical training and we forget about the customer service training or we just think it's okay. And at the end of the day, if it's not, if it's not structured, if it's not managed, then it's going to be all over the board. So, you know, you may think that it's good, but it's going to be inconsistent at best because of the, the process of people just kind of making, uh, making their own decisions in the field. And so having some consistency there and saying, this is how we handle these situations. This is our way that we handle customer service is a very vital component of, of the training program. Uh, Justin, for you, how are you kind of uh, measuring the effectiveness of training whenever you're, you're dealing with it on the one-on-one the -on -one basis? I, I, I think we kind of went over this already, but 
to, to go over is just knowing that you've trained somebody on or gone over an item and, uh, and seeing if they fail at it several times afterward and ask them what's going on. Now, to go on the positive side of that is to teach somebody something, see them fail a couple of times, address it, and then see the improvement. And, and I'll take one that actually was for today was uh, it was on my automotive tech. He had a vehicle that they thought the key was bad on, so I sent him out to it. He goes, he goes, checks it out, says, hey, I've, I've even erased, reprogrammed, still having the same issue, security lights out. Okay, why don't we do our own key on it now and verify? And we have ways to use inventory without burning inventory. Um, so he's done that, calls him back, says, I can see the keys are in the system. It's still not working. Okay. What do you what do you think we should do next? He goes, Well, I think I'm gonna do a diagnostics on it. I'll call you back. Perfect. Sounds great, dude. Hang up. So he's telling me what he's gonna do. I'm yeah. not telling him what he needs to be doing. That stuff right there just puts a smile on my face because I know that he's catching on and I know and he's just over a year now. So he's at that level where he's just started an event on his own. And just seeing that stuff like that, where we've had the issue, we've we've addressed the issues, he's catching on now. And now he's advancing on his own. He's sure. actually taking the initiatives. Most definitely. And I'll share kind of our perspective as, as kind of we wrap up the conversation here um, from a time perspective. Uh, our organization, we went into, uh, we, we recognized about a year and a half ago that, you know, we talked a lot about the fact that we believed in training, but we hadn't actually put the resources behind it that we should have. And so uh, we actually put a, uh, a person into a training director's position and their all, only role is to train our new hires and to maintain continued education for our team. Um, and since then, we've had four classes. And so this is one of the things that we ran into a few years ago when we started to hire more than one person at a time. And we were trying to bring in more than one new employee and and trying to manage training for more than one person became very, very complex. So putting somebody in there allowed us to process that. And we've learned a lot through the process of it. Our training directors learned a lot through the process of training people. And a couple of takeaways that we've that we've had is one is repetition. Uh, you, there's no, there's no, um, uh, there's no replacement for repetition. And that's one of the big, I feel like fail points in training is you learn something one time, but you never have an opportunity to apply it. So repetition through the training process gets you the ability to continue to apply it on a regular basis. Um, and I'll talk about how we do that in just a second, but also, um, from a hiring standpoint, we talked about this, I think a couple of weeks back on one of these uh, security professional roundtables is, you know, trying to make yourself appealing to hire for or new talent. And one of the things that we've learned through the process is having a defined training program, one that says your training program is going to be this length of time. These are the things that you're going to learn, and this is how it's going to progress. And we will we will validate or certify you at the end of that so that we know that you have, you've gone through that training process. So we define that, and we have uh, put together an intensive eight to 10-week training program that every new team member comes in and processes. Um, and it is a mix of classroom and hands-on training, which has uh, been very impactful. And we've been able to uh, hire and train 11 people in that process since we put that training director in place. And I've got a picture on the screen here that will show, uh, which is our training room that we've been able to shift over to. Um, and we've been able to put that in place, which has been very beneficial. So it has certain things in there, like we've got a training door with some modular training components on it, uh, where they can replace uh, the, the area where the lock would be installed. They can replace that over and over again. So that gives us the ability for repetition. They can go in there and drill, I think on the block of wood, they can drill 10 cylindrical lock preps on it. Um, that's a lot of practice. Once you do that, you get the you get the the hang of it. It's got a place where you can replace the the component, the header for uh, for a door closer. And then we also have just uh, uh, rough openings where we can practice doing our door frame installations, and that gives us the ability to take door frames down, put a door frame up, take a door frame down, take a door put a door frame up. And we borrowed that from other people as well, uh, places that we've seen. Uh, we also, uh, for practical application for locksmiths, we do in our business and the commercial side, we do a lot of cabinet lock work. And so we were able to procure a set of cabinets for a commercial from a commercial client, and then a bunch of replacement doors. 
So uh, if you've ever gone out in the field and installed cabinet locks or had a new hire go out and install a cabinet lock and they drill it on the wrong side, um, you have to buy those things and then you have to replace <laughs> them. Uh, so we have now a whole set of those where new hires can come in and they can keep drilling um, and practice so they can get the repetition of it, the measurement of it, and know how that works. We do that with mailbox locks. And then we have our entire electronic section as well uh, for cameras and access control and all that. And then we can wire all that into to the doors. And the whole reason that we did that and we invested in that area in our organization was exactly for the point of repetition. Uh, we were trying to do our best to shrink down that, uh, that time frame and be able to give our team members the ability to practice when they can. And Justin said that earlier. He's got a, a nice facility there where anybody can come in and jump in and practice and work on things to get better at it. And I think that's a key for any training component uh, to focus on. So um, that, I just wanted to kind of share some of what we're doing here, some of the things that we've learned. We've not done training well for a long period of time, and we're just trying to get better at it with every class. Our final thing that we do with our team members once they go through the training program is we have uh, basically a, 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 a training test at the end. And it's not a written test. It's a practical test. So we bring them into our facility and they do a simulated site visit. So they come in and we give them the tasks to do just like they would be doing in the field. And they can go do those and perform those tasks on different areas in our facility. And so then we get the real life understanding of if they've caught it and if they've got it. And we simulate a, kind of a customer experience. So that's kind of the way that we do it. Um, and then once that happens, then we can progress them out to a van um, and they can, they can start to work independently. And then we both have a level of confidence to work with them um, and then support them from that aspect give everybody kind of a, a closing opportunity. Chad, anything that you would like to share from way of closing, and then we'll toss over to Justin uh, to close out for today. Yeah, I think just staying persistent and intentional with training and use all of the tools that you have at your disposal. The technology is phenomenal that we, we can use our, our smartphones. You know, I'll, I'll say this kind of as a pitch for uh, Asa Abloy. We have this thing called the Asa Abloy, Asa Abloy Customer Support App. And if you're dealing with our products at all, you need that app because your technicians, your people out in the field can get the installation instructions. They can get all of the templates. They can get the catalog. So if they're trying to upsell a job, customers got a worn out hardware, they can say, hey, this is what I'm actually trying to uh, recommend to you right now. This is a picture of it. Here are some of the features. So all of that is completely at your fingertips. So again, uh, Asaboli customer support app, it's available on iTunes and on your Google Play and everything. But check that out. So digital tools, lean into that. Lean into all of the professional organizations that are now doing these webinars as much as you can. I know everybody's busy, but as much as you can, tune into the webinars, even if it's only for half of it, you should gain some information, some nuggets of wisdom that you can take away. And again, just uh, stick with it. Training has to be intentional. It has to be, um, it's got to be a part of your business. It's got to be a part of it. Mm, that's a very good point. It has to be a part of your business if you're going to continue to grow. Justin, any closing thoughts? The best thing I can tell people uh, that are training or maybe even new to training an employee, maybe their first employee, is try not to be frustrated. Try not to get upset. Things are going to break. You're in business. Uh, be prepared to pay for some things, but just try not to be frustrated or upset about it, and especially try not to take that frustration out on the employee. Um, they're learning. They're gaining, and hopefully one day they may be running your shop for you. So just keep that in mind. Very valid point. Again, thank you to HL Flake for helping to support this and to uh, promote this and promote this conversation for our locksmith community. Thank you to Justin and Chad for joining us today and talking about training. This is a vital component for us to continue our moving our industry forward um, from a professional standpoint. So thank you again for tuning in today and watching this episode of the Security Professionals Roundtable. We'll see you next Thursday for another episode to continue the conversation. Have a great day.